Well, good morning. Um, as your pastor, my name's Nate. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, hopefully I get a chance to meet you after service. But as your pastor, I thought I should take a moment and just encourage some people in the room. Um, there's something that happened this week that affected people in both Dover and in Plymouth. And so just want to take a moment and encourage you. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Patriots lost on Monday night. And uh, let me just encourage you with this. Like, we always lose in Miami late in the season. So big game on today at 4.30. And we've got Steelers fans uh, at both locations. And it just really speaks to our church that no matter who you root for, like, you have a place. When we enter the auditorium, like, church life, it's not about, like, no matter who, who you are, no matter who you root for, um, we welcome you here, and, and you're welcome <laughs> like it's part of the kingdom of God. And, and uh, anyway, let, so that's going on today. So some people will be crying later today. Uh, we, we'll find out who. So listen, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the winter of 2008. And I know some of you old timers talk about the blizzard of 78, but the winter of 2008 was one that really... Uh, marked my life and, and Michelle's life and our marriage, and really, um, over the next uh, over the last nine years, that winter really um, really set something in stone um, in in our marriage and in God's work in our life. So I want to talk to you about it, and then we'll we'll look at the Bible and we'll talk about that and the lessons we learned are found in Scripture, and so we'll look at at, at, at those things, and then and then we'll grow and. And change, and um, we'll love Jesus more, and we'll become more like him. And for those of you in here who've never made the decision to follow Jesus, or maybe you don't even believe in him, we just want you to hear about him this morning above everything else, and, and, and for you to open up your life to him, uh, and, uh, and, and to experience him for yourself. Uh, well, so 2008 was kind of a monumental year for Michelle and I, and uh, s- some some big things that happened for us. So first, well, I, I guess maybe it is first. But so in 2008, Michelle and I bought our first house, which was exciting, and uh, it was a it was a, a fixer upper, and you know there was holes in the walls and Iron Shack carpeting and hot pink walls and and the electrical you know, like it had electrical wires like running on the outside of the baseboard to, to for plugs and and it was. It was in need of a lot of work, and so we bought that house, and then also that year, our first son, Beniah, was born on Thanksgiving of 2008, and so we, we had our first son, and, and because Michelle was, at, b- before he was born, she was expecting, and uh, we, you know, we began to make some lifestyle, lifestyle changes, so Michelle, that year um, before he was born, she stopped working and, and, and hasn't worked a full-time job since. I don't think she's worked um, for an employer since. She, she's done different things to make, to make money. But, um, but so she, she moved from, from working um, that way to, to working inside the house. And, and that was a huge move for us. And you just take a minute to, to kind of speak to any of the any of the people in the church who are um, homemakers and, and caring for the house, like I know for us, we could never afford to have anybody do what Michelle does for our household. And so, man, like we recognize that and see your value in that. And, um, and so just, you know, we'll just speak to that for a second. But when Michelle stopped working, she was actually making more money than me at the time. And so it was a significant, like, decrease in household income. And, and so was we, we bought that house uh, when we had two incomes and then when we didn't have any children. And so as we lost income and then had a, another child, we, we like just very quickly realized we never should have bought this house. And we were in 2008, this was before the market crash, and so we were still part of the people who got home mortgages who never should have got home mortgages. And so that, we were us, but we never, we never did foreclose, praise the Lord. Um, but it was, a, it was a difficult thing for us. And so as, as the temperature began to drop, all of a sudden I began to realize, like, I'm not sure how 
we're going to be able to pay to heat this house. If you can remember back that long ago, those of you who were buying oil back then, oil was $3.79 a gallon that winter. Um, this week you could buy oil for $2.29 a gallon, and, and this summer you could have bought it for like $1.70. So it would cost us $950 to fill a tank, which we never did. And um, most of the time, we found one guy in that area who would deliver 50 gallons of oil, and he was the only guy who would do it. And so we were buying oil from him all winter. And, and so that winter, again, like we were really broke. And, uh, and I'm not exaggerating on this, and, and I don't want you, I just want you to know, like, Sometimes you hear preachers and they tell you a story and you're like, there's no way that ever happened and it's true. Those things never happen. Like they embellish the story. If I embellish the story, I'll tell you I'm embellishing the story. It's really important for me to be kind of literal and factual, factual because when I talk about Jesus, I want you to believe about those things. And so I don't want you to just think I'm like just hyping things up. So these are true statements that I'm about to share for you. So that winter, we kept our house at 55 degrees that winter with a newborn baby. And even keeping the house at that temperature, we were still using about 100 gallons of oil a month. And uh, so it's $380 a month, which we did not have to keep the house at 55 degrees. The house was born in 1918. Uh, the house was built in 1918. And uh, it's not a sci-fi movie. And the house was built in 1918, and we did some renovations a couple years later, and so we discovered the kitchen had an addition put on in the 1930s, and it was literally insulated with newspaper. And because uh, we, we took down the wall in the bathroom, it was crumpled up newspaper in the walls that was used to insulate it. And I know it's in the 1930s because when I un like uncrinkled one of these newspapers, there's a picture of Hitler on it with a date 1938. So it was, the addition was put on after that. So we were, this was the house we were living in. These were the conditions we were living in. And um, we learned something about God's provision that year that marked us. Michelle and I learned something about God's provision that allowed us to follow him in a way that we probably wouldn't have uh, had we not learned those les lessons that year. And it taught us something about, about God that we knew in our head, but had never experienced in our life that winter. So God did some, some miracles for us. And, and I'm going to share those with you. And honestly, it's going to feel like that's not really a miracle. And you're going to think like, I don't know, I think this guy's reaching a little bit. I don't think it was God. I think it was a coincidence. But one thing that I've learned is that I'm going to give God credit for everything in my life, whether it was him or not. Because the opposite is this, is God did something for me and I don't give him the credit for it. And so I don't want to be on that side of it. And so maybe it was a coincidence and some of these, I mean, I'm sharing them with you because I don't really think it was a coincidence. It was just these little ways that God provided for us that, that created a testimony for us and that showed us and allowed us to rely on God in, um, in, you know, in a very real way. So here's one of the things that happened. Um, my mom had come over to the house, I think it was about a week and a half before Christmas, and so we didn't have a Christmas tree, and so she's asking us, like, hey, will you get a, get a Christmas tree? And so I'm like, oh, you know, we're not going to get a Christmas tree, and so she's like, you have to get a Christmas tree, and, you know, and, and I'm like, listen, our son, he's a few weeks old, he doesn't know anything that's going on, he's not going to remember that we didn't get a Christmas tree, so yeah, we're just not going to do it this year. And so she press, pressured me a little bit more, and I'm like, listen, honestly, we can't afford a Christmas tree, like, we don't have money to go buy a Christmas tree. Um, I heard there's really good deals after Christmas. I can go get one then if I need one, but like <laughs> we're, we're not going to get one. So what my mom did is she, she gave us, she had a fake Christmas tree and she gave it to us. So we could have a Christmas tree and she had some old ornaments she dug through and gave them to us. And, and th listen, that, that was a way that God provided for us. So you think like, oh, whatever, whatever. And so you think whatever you want. For me, I was just it just opened things up for us. And, and, you know, that Christmas, like, man, it was really, um, we, P 
pinched pennies and we bought our son one gift and he doesn't remember this and so don't tell him because he'll take offense to it now. But we got him one gift. I think we probably spent $15 on that one gift. And then the other things we had for him were like diapers. Like, here you go, diapers. And again, he doesn't know because he was a kid. So why spend money on someone who won't appreciate it? So <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have really said that. Um, because honestly, some of you will get your teenager's gifts, and you know their attitude. Uh, so, um, we should appreciate everything. So, listen, another thing that happened to us um, that year, uh, we ended up renting one of the bedrooms in the house to someone who needed a place to live. So, as someone who had gone through the youth group and and uh, it wasn't a youth group anymore. And so they came, they moved in, they rented a bedroom from us. And, and they rented that room from us for a couple of years. And the month, the, the, what they paid us every month to rent that room from us just about covered our heating costs to keep the house at 55 degrees all winter. And now they had electric heater in their room, uh, so, uh, so you don't have to worry about them. But, but that was, uh, they, they ended up living up with us for a couple of years. And and that really opened up something for us. And we've had people live with us every day, except for maybe a couple of weeks since then. And it's just been one of the things that God has, has done to continually provide for us. And then a third thing that happened was uh, uh, God opened up a door for me to get a second job as a school bus driver. So 2008, I was here as student ministries pastor at Restoration Church, but I needed to you know, I needed more income because we just lost Michelle's income. And so I got a job as a school bus driver. And, and that, that winter, and again, I'm not exaggerating, but I was working 80 hours a week, uh, most weeks, taking any available field trip or, 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 or sports uh, activity after school that I could to try to, we, we needed every single penny that, uh, that God would provide. And so I signed up for for every trip possible. And, you know, that was an exhausting winter. And, and Michelle, will, she'll tell you stories and verify this, but, I mean, I would come home at the end of the day and you'd get the, the, the little baby and, and, um, and, and I'd fall asleep with him. Even the next winter, I was still driving the bus company and we had two babies the next winter. And, um, and you know, I would lay down on the floor to play with them, and then I'd just fall asleep. And they didn't know any difference. They would just climb on me and wrestle and jump on me, and I would sleep through the entire thing. And I'd wake up, eat dinner, and then it would be crashing at like 7, 7.30 at night. And, and it was exhausting, but God provided that. He provided just every penny we need. And kind of the testimony coming out of that winter, like one huge testimony is our pipes never froze. And you just think about that, like, that's a really, that's a big concern when you're, when you're broke, that, that it's going to turn into thousands of dollars of damage. And, and then once everything thawed, then it turns into mold and health problems. And, but God, he, he provided as much as we need. Like, I would have loved to have the house at 62 degrees, but he provided enough to keep it at 55 degrees. And, and, and we learned lessons from that, and I gave him all... All the, uh, all the praise for that. And then, and then kind of secondly, we, never, we didn't starve to death that winter. He provided just enough. It, it didn't turn into Jamestown 1609 in our house. Like he provided just enough and we made it through. And we learned lessons about God's provision that year that just, just, set, everything, just set everything forward for the next years of our life as you know some of you were here a couple years ago we gave to you know when, when just regular giving and just the way things that God's called us to and the ways that he's called us to to sacrifice and the ways that we've learned to recognize his provision like that was a defining winter in our life if you got your bibles open to Matthew chapter 17 and we're going to be looking uh here in this passage of scripture. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. We're given a, uh, it's our joy. And the people of the church, we buy Bibles to give to people who don't have a Bible. We gave away a bunch during the first service. To, uh, we had a teenager in service this, this morning who'd never been to church in his entire life. And we gave him his first Bible. It's just amazing. Um, 
It's amazing. We love that. So we'd love to give you one. And uh, if you've got your phone and you're using the Bible on your phone, why don't you t just take a second and switch your translation to the ESV. We're going to be reading uh, the, the first part of the scripture out of that translation this morning. So what's going on here is um, there's a guy named Matthew, and he is writing down his eyewitness account of the events that he saw. Matthew was one of the people who followed Jesus, and for three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, Matthew was there almost every moment. And so in the book of Matthew, when he records the things he writes down, he was an eyewitness to those events. Now, we also, in this series of stories, we've been looking at all these different events of Jesus' life and all these different things that happened. Luke was, was a doctor, and he interviewed eyewitnesses and wrote down and collected all of these eyewitnesses' accounts and verified them and, and cross-referenced them and, and wrote these things down for a guy named Theo. And he's presented, like, all right, here's the... Here's the account and the evidence of, of, of Jesus and, and of the things he did. So what we're about to read right here is Matthew writing, a, writing about Peter and this interaction that Peter had with some Jewish people and with Jesus. And Peter learned about God's provision in this story. And, and so that's the connection between my story and what we'll read and then what God um, has us to, to learn this morning and wants to grow us this morning. So, uh, starting in verse number 24. When they had come to Capernaum, the collectors of the tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And, he went, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is showing us two things. One, he knows what you don't. And two, he uses unconventional methods to show us his unbelievable power. And those are going to be the two things that we're looking at this morning. But before we kind of break down those two things, I want to help to explain what's going on in this passage so that you can understand it and, uh, and, and kind of some of, it, some of the other significance that we're not talking about this morning. Uh, maybe you, it'll help you understand it. So what's happening here is there are Jewish people collecting tax from other Jewish people for the temple. So Jewish people would, would pay tax toward the temple, and this would help to uh, maintain the temple and help to run the temple. This isn't the shady kind of tax collecting that you're maybe familiar with or that you've heard talked about before. Um, Matthew was one of those shady tax collectors that Jesus saved. And what there was other tax because the Jewish citizens were also under in part of the Rome under the Roman Empire and under Roman authority. So they would hire Jewish people to collect Roman tax from the Jewish people, and then the tax collectors would overcharge and skim some off the top for themselves. And that was shady. That's not what was going on here. These were really this was honest and and they were and people, the Jewish people gave willingly toward this because they, they, they needed a temple, they loved the temple, and they wanted to honor the temple. So th they gave willingly. And, but the reason they're asking Peter, is Jesus going to pay the temple taxes? Because they're trying to find out who is Jesus really. They had a lot of suspicion about him at this point. He said a lot of things that made them nervous. And they're trying to find out, is Jesus... Um, is he a rebel? Is he, um, is he an imposter? Is he a criminal? Is he an insurrectionist? Like, what's going on here? And Jesus had said some things that I'll, I'll talk about. In a, he, he had said some things um, like, in three days, I will, uh, I, or he, he said, I will tear down this temple, and in three days, I'll rebuild it again. And so they're like asking questions like, 
all right, so what is he going to do? Is he, you know, he's Jewish. Is he going to contribute to this as well? So Jesus is obviously committed to God, which the temple is important to the Jewish people because that is the place they went to meet God and to be in the presence of God. So Jesus is obviously committed to God as he is God and as he is the son of God. But he isn't concerned about the temple. The physical building, he's not concerned about that. And that was why he said, I will destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it again. He, he, is, he is a fulfillment of the temple. He is the, he is the, um, the, the next temple. And when he said this, you can read this in the Bible. When he said, I will destroy the temple and in three days I'll rebuild it, they like, responded back like, how are you going to rebuild the temple in three days? It took us 40 years to build it or to, to rebuild it after the last time it was torn down. And if you think that's crazy, like 46 years to build a building, like that's unbelievable. I want to show you a picture. Uh, I pronounced it wrong, but it's um, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. So this is a cathedral that they're building that they've been building for the last 133 years. The architect was uh, designed it in the 19th century. And they're excited. And the reason I got a picture of it is part of a news article that says, uh, hey, they're almost done building it. It's 70% complete. Should be, they should finish it in the year 2026. So they've been building this. And so, like, you know, think about Jesus showing up and say, hey, I'm going to tear that down. And I'm going to rebuild it again over the weekend. Um, you know, it's going to be extreme, ha- extreme makeover. I'm going to bring in a bunch of people. We're going to build it right back up. The people will be like, get out of here. You're insane. It's not going to happen. So this is kind of the conversation here. And what we know now that they didn't know then was he was the replacement for the temple. After his resurrection from the grave, you no longer needed to go to a physical building to experience the presence of God. Jesus changed all of that. He sent the Holy Spirit, who is, the, the, who is God, and his presence is everywhere. Yeah, he's here in the building, but this is not the only place you can experience the presence of God. You can, you can be with God anywhere. And if you make a decision to follow you, the Bible even says the presence of God is in you. You are now the physical building. You are the temple of God. And Jesus is, he is now uh, fulfilled it where the presence of God is accessible to everyone everywhere, not just Jewish people worshiping in a temple. Jesus, just one quick lesson for us to learn here. He is not concerned about buildings. His concern is for people. And we don't want to forget that. You know, we have a building here. We have a building in Plymouth. We'll have other buildings in the future. And, and we, we, you know, we upgrade buildings. We clean buildings. We'll expand buildings. We'll do all these things to these buildings. But we remember it is not about these buildings. We don't live to protect these buildings. Uh, our focus and our mission is not these buildings. These buildings are a tool to present Jesus to people and to share the gospel with people. And so people can, can like, question sometimes or, um, you know, they got to like, you know, and they could say like, oh, we should sell all the buildings and, uh, and, uh, and, and not have any buildings and whatever. Listen, how would you like to be having service right now in the parking lot? All right. So it all of a sudden it becomes very like real why we have a building and a building Helps you like you're gonna invite your friends and they're gonna be like, nah, you, you know what? It's zero degrees out today. I don't think I'm gonna go and uh, and go to service today, and so I'm gonna skip. But a building takes away obstacles to help us to present Jesus. So they're very practical. They're very useful. But they are just buildings. There's nothing holy about this except for the fact that we're here. So we can sell this one building. It can go and it can go back to being Dover Bingo like it was how many decades ago. Um, but it's just a building. So if we want to tear it down, if we want to paint it pink, if we want to use it to play games, you know, or, or to, to rent it out, it is just a building. But it is a tool that we've purposed to use for God's glory. So then kind of in the passage of Scripture, 
So it's saying like Jesus begins to like lay out this these theological truths, these uh, these these truths about him and about us and about God. And he he asks Peter this question: Does the king collect taxes from his sons, or from from like people that have been captured, or people that have been uh, people that from from citizens, people that aren't his sons? And so um, Peter's like, no, he doesn't collect it from his sons. He collects it from other people. And so Jesus says, that's right. So what he's essentially saying is, he, he says, right, sons are free. So why do I, as God's son, would I pay taxes to my father's house? I don't owe any taxes to a building my father owns. The temple is God's house and God is his father. But then he goes on to say something that is true of you and I, that as we follow Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God as well. We are free as well. We have no, uh, we owe God nothing. That's an important thing for us to know. Sons and daughters of God, we owe him nothing. We in fact, he gave us everything. He has opened his entire kingdom to us. As we'll continue to see, he has made all of his resources available to us. You're not in debt to God. Maybe people don't think about this financially, but they, they, they think about this in the way they live because they think, well, I can't come to church until I get my life right. I, you know, and Maybe they've done, they've made some mistakes in their life and they just live under that and they won't let God forgive them. They won't let God change them. They won't, they, they won't let themselves have peace or enjoy life or be filled with joy because they think like, well, I've, done, I've made too many mistakes. I, I, you know, I, need, to, I need to keep myself here um, so to sh just show God like that, uh, that whatever, that I, that I owe him and I'm, and I'm trying to pay him back. One church word that we don't use here, we don't believe in here, but, but you may be familiar with is this idea of penance. So I've done wrong and now I am in debt to God. I need to pay something back to God for, for what I've done wrong. And that's just not, that's not, a, that's not a, a, an idea that you'll find in the Bible, which is something that Jesus is showing us here. Sons and daughters of God are free. They, have, they are owed nothing. So as sons and daughters of God who are free, we then begin to jump into the story of, the, of provision. And what we realize and what we want to say, look at these two things. One, he knows what you don't. Who knows that there's a fish Swimming in a body of water, 64 square, square mile body of water, that there's a fish floating, uh, there's a fish swimming in the water and it has a coin in its mouth. Who knows that? Who knows that you're going to travel to this Sea of Galilee, you're going to sit out in a boat, you're going to cast a hook and the first one, the first fish you pull out is going to be that fish. Does that I mean, is that all coincidence? No, God knows what you don't. God knows what you could never know. There, a word that we use to describe this attribute of Jesus is omniscience. He is all-knowing. There is never something that God doesn't know. There is never uh, something that he's forgotten. There is never something that he's m misplaced. He knows everything all at once, at the same time, he, he never has to learn. One of the scriptures in the Bible that I love is that he knows the numbers of hair on your head. So he knows that instantly. He knows how many you lost down the shower drain this morning. And he doesn't have to come back at every night and like recount. He doesn't send angels to take polls. He instantly knows every detail of your life at all times. He is on knowing his omniscience, because he knows what you don't, because he knows all things, this allows us to trust. He knows all. He knows what we don't, and so we're able to trust. We trust 
that he knows. We trust that he provides. We trust that he cares. And we even trust that he hasn't forgotten about us. Because sometimes it seems like maybe your provision's not coming. Sometimes it feels like you've just been waiting and nothing's happened. Did you wonder, like, God, did you forget about me? Do you, do you remember me? Did you reallocate what I needed to someone else? Like, was there a, a shipping error? Like, what's gone on? God, I, I need you to do something and, and nothing's happening. In the same kind of time period in our life, um, as 2008, I don't know if it was 2007 or 2009, but kind of in the same window of time, uh, Michelle and I had gone to a restaurant and uh, the hostess sat us at our booth and no one ever came back. So after about 10 minutes, we realized this. And so we started keeping track of the time and we weren't really mad about it. For us, it just turned into like this this game and we were having fun with it and it turned into a story. So it was like, you know, if there's anything that ever happens that we can tell a story about later, like we like those things. It really doesn't really matter how bad it was, you know, and I'm like, man, I'll preach a story about this one day. And so that one day is today. And so <laughs> we sitting at the booth and it, eventually we started keeping track of time because it'd been so long. No one came up to bring us water. No one brought us menus. We were just sitting there. And, um, and so 45 minutes later, and again, I'm not exaggerating this, 45 minutes later, someone finally comes up and says, has anybody taken your order? And we're like, no one's even asked us if we want water or drink yet. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And so what happened was the chef quit. Like right before we got there, the chef just walked out and left. And so the waiters, waitresses, the hosts, the managers, they're cooking all of the food in the back. And it is complete chaos. And so we're just sitting there quietly timing. And so they're all apologetic. And so Michelle and I are really excited to see what are they going to do to like make this up to us. And so we, you know, again, we, we're broke during this time. And so we're so broke. We're like, man, let's go. They're like, let's go on a big, hot, extravagant date to Friendly's. Yes, it was Friendly's in Dover. And, <laughs> and, and, and so like we're splurging like, hey, you want to melt? No, no, let's go big. Let's get a super melt. Like, it is a, it is a big deal for us to be going out on this event. So we're just thinking, like, man, I think they're, gonna, they're probably going to do something to make this up for us. And so we're, like, you know, we're, like, taking a big chance. Like, man, let's order some extra stuff and see just, like, just on the chance. Like, they got to do something about this. So we ordered some extra food, and it was free. <laughs> they comped the entire meal. It was all free. It's amazing. We still gave a tip. It was amazing. It was amazing. Like, but we could think like, oh, nothing's happening. They've forgotten about us. There's been some mistake. But God never forgets about us. He knows what you need. He knows what you've prayed for. And if he, if he's not, if he's not doing something, it's because there's a work in our heart that he's doing. God didn't want us, honestly. God didn't want us heating our house at 70 degrees that winter. He wanted us to learn. One, don't buy a house you can't afford. He wanted us to learn that lesson. He wanted us to learn how to tithe when we didn't have enough food to eat. He wanted us to learn that lesson. He wanted us to learn how he provides as much as we need, not necessarily more. He wanted us to learn that lesson. And there was a big part, a character process he wanted us to bring. He wanted to bring us on that winter. That he brought us on. And so when there's delay, when there's no answers, but you're, you're doing the scripture that I'm about to read, when you're doing these things, you just know he is the process and you're just trusting. All right, he hasn't forgotten about me. It's uncomfortable. I wish he would answer sooner, but he has not forgotten about me. You trust his omniscience. You trust that he knows what you don't. So Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. I'll read it for you. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else 
and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Let me say this. Knowing this scripture, you don't have to be jealous when other people are blessed by God. You don't have to be jealous that God's meeting other people's needs, that they've got a promotion, that they've got, uh, you know, that they've bought in a house, that, that you don't have to be jealous of what they have and what God's done for someone else because this scripture is true for everyone. And what God, what it could encourage you is what God did for them, he can do for you. How God answered their prayer, he can answer yours. And listen, not every person's journey is going to, um, going to have stuff because sometimes God, people, God calls people to give up everything as part of their process. And, but God blesses them in completely other ways, um, which is probably a, a lot better. So he says two things here. There's a promise. Your father knows everything you need, and the promise is he will give you everything you need if you seek first the kingdom, and then secondly, if you live righteously. If you're doing those things, those two things, you're just pursuing God, or you love God, or you're following God, and then you're living righteously, that's a promise you can stand on 100%, completely confident. He's going to supply my needs. So he knows what you don't. And then secondly, he uses unconventional methods to show us his unbelievable power. He doesn't really do the same thing twice. I don't, but there's no other place in scripture where he sent them to go get money out of, you go, out of a fish. He, he, will, he will do something for you that he's never done before. He will provide for you a second time in a way he's never done before because he wants us to know that it was him. That we don't just dismiss everything as coincidence or that we don't take credit for it. This fish uh, in a mouth, this coin in the mouth of a fish, you know, not only does it show his, not, his all knowing, his omniscience, but it shows his omnipotence. And it, 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 this is a church word that means that he's all powerful. And he wants to demonstrate this. He wants to show you this. As he talks about this, and he, he, he talks about the kingdom of God, one thing that he's showing us through this situation is that the king has resources. The king has unlimited resources. That God, our Father, Jesus, his Son, they know where every coin is in the world. They know where every dollar is in the world. They know where every even Bitcoin is. They know it all. There's no part of, and, and he is the owner of it all. Every bit of it. So the, the, kind of the one thing to really learn and grasp is that resources are never the, never the issue obediences. God, he's got unlimited resources. He knows where every lost coin is. He can bring resources to you absolutely without any issue. Resources aren't the issue. Obedience is the issue. When Jesus told Peter, all right, I want you to, why don't you go travel to the Sea of Galilee, let down a hook, and then the first fish you pull up, open the mouth, look in there. There'll be, a, there'll be a coin in there. And then you go pay that tax for you and for me. And he could have been like, all right, Jesus, thanks a lot. What kind of a stupid, I got so much better things to do than this. And just, and just left and left it alone. The resource was there, but was Peter willing to obey him and take those steps of obedience? Another story that was that happened with Jesus and with Peter and some of the other disciples. They had been fishing all night. Jesus wasn't there. They had been fishing all night, and uh, they didn't catch anything. And so it's morning time, and, and um, they are packing up their nets. They're cleaning up, and Jesus shows up, and he says, Hey, 
why don't you drop your nets on the other side of the boat, other side of the boat, and then you'll catch fish. And they could have been like, Jesus, do you know anything about fishing? Do you know how this works? And that, it doesn't make what difference what side of the boat you put it on, all right? We're catching large schools of fish. There's no fish here. Like, thanks for your great idea. We thought you were all knowing. Apparently, you don't know anything about fishing. Everything else you seem to be good at. Fishing, you know nothing. And they could have just ignored them and be like, no, we're tired. Like, come on, stop playing games with us. But they obeyed. They unfolded their nets, cast it off the other side of the boat, and then caught so many fish their nets almost broke. It's obedience. It's obedience. In a story in the Old Testament, this was before, uh, before Jesus put on human flesh and, and came to earth, uh, there was a prophet and he came to, speak, he came to a lady's house and um, it was a, a, a single mom and her son, and, uh, and they, were, they have run out of food. And so she was preparing to bake her last little biscuit that she would feed her son, and then they would die. And it was the end, it was the end for her and her son. And the prophet showed up and said, hey, why don't you gather every empty container you can? And she could have been like, you know what, I'm not gonna, we're going to die. I'm not wasting my last bit of energy on following, the, following like whatever the advice or encouragement of some guy. I don't know. Um, I'm not doing it. And she could have ignored him. And she could have, she could have died. She, you know, and she's like, oh, you know what, I'm just going to spend this last time with my son and I'm not going to do this. But she was obedient. So she went and knocked on doors and she gathered every empty jug she could find. And then the prophet said, begin to pour the little bit of oil that you have in the jugs. She began to pour the oil in the jugs. The oil never ran out of what she had. And every jug was full. And then when she ran out of jugs to fill, it stopped pouring. And what happened was, God provided for her. And she began, she, because all those jugs were full, she resold the oil, and it provided income for her and her son. But they didn't starve to death. Obedience was the issue. It wasn't resources. She couldn't see how God could take the little bit she had and turn it into enough to provide for her family. But God knew. God's been calling you to do something. And you're, you're praying like for God to do a miracle, it, but, but what is it that he's calling you to do? What is the step that you need to take to obey? If you seek him first, not his blessings, not material things, you seek him, a love for him, and then you live righteously, every need you have will be met. And not on your time schedule, on the time schedule God has for you. Because he cares more about you than just meeting your needs. He cares about changing you, changing, your, changing you and, and taking you through a process to help you to be able to trust him for more the next time. And that he can bring you kind of on greater challenges forward to help you to reach more people, to accomplish more for his kingdom, to look more like Jesus in your everyday life. What is it? He, maybe it's applying for a job in your company and, you, and you're just like, well, I, I, don't have, I don't have the qualifications they want. But you just feel like God telling you to apply. Well, apply. What's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to tell you no? Well, how are you any worse off than, than you were before? Well, now I know I'm terrible. Come on, stop being, having a pity party. He's calling you to give and you just think like, well, we can't afford it. There's no way we can afford it. Right, well, you're asking them to meet your needs. You now need to kind of take the step. What is it? Last um, last week we were working in the uh, one of the offices here at the church. Where we were ripping out some carpet that had seen the end of its life. And uh, so as we're cleaning it out, and then you know, there's just always dirt on the carpets. It's one of the amazing miracles of 
of life. And uh, so we were sweeping out the office and I saw a penny on the ground. This is not the penny. I had to get this one from Pastor Andrew before service. Um, There's a penny on the ground. And uh, I was going to sweep it up into this dustpan and throw it away. You know, shame on me, sure. Uh, but anyway, just being honest with you. So, um, and, and so as I was sweeping up the penny, and I was going to sweep it up into the dustpan, I thought, I wonder how many people ask God to provide money for them, and then they throw away pennies. And they're asking God every day, like every day, God, I need you to, I need you to provide for me. And then, they, then there's pennies on the ground, and they just walk by them, and they throw them away. And... Uh, so I sweeped it up in the dustpan, and I was, like, really convicted, like, pick up the penny so you can tell the story. So I took the penny out of the dustpan and put it in my pocket and, and kept it. And I guess a, a practical step for you to take today and, and maybe to live out the rest of your life is to begin picking up pennies and thanking God for it. Because you have no idea where that penny came from. You never, if, you never knew you lost it. It might not even be yours, but we always come across pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. Pick them up and thank God for it in that morning or in that moment. God, I, I thank you for this penny. I just need 59,990 more. Thank you. Put it in your pocket and begin to steward. And, and maybe it's not God bringing you pennies, but you're going to begin to be grateful for them and give them thanks. And maybe he is just testing you like, all right, you're asking me to provide a resource. There it is. And you just think like, nah, God, I'm going to, uh, something bigger. Something bigger, thanks. I would like you to provide my miracle in one shot, that little by little. And if you can just begin picking it up and saying, hey, God, thank you. Whether it was you or whether this is a coincidence, I'm giving you credit for it. Thank you for providing a little bit more toward my need. Put it in your pocket. Go to your bank. Be like, I have a, I have a deposit to make, 33 cents. And begin thanking God for the ways he's providing for you. Don't overlook it. Don't dismiss it. Don't mock it. Give him the glory. If you'll close your eyes, I want to take a moment and pray for you. We're gonna, I want to pray for two groups of people today. The first, if you're here this morning and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you've never heard about Jesus talked about this way, you, man, there's just something in your heart that knows this is for you. This is, this is what this is what you need. This is why you're here. I'm going to, I'll lead you in a prayer, and you can write this down and pray it later. You can reword this if you want. These words aren't magical. Just, you may have never talked to God before, and so I'm going to help you and kind of give you a framework of what to say. So I'll pray, and you can whisper this where you're seated, or you can pray this later. Jesus, I give you my life today, and I'm making the decision to follow you. I believe that you're God's son. I believe that you died and rose again. And I believe that you're my savior. I am deciding to follow you today. Help me to learn to love you and help me to follow you every day for the rest of my life. Amen. Keep your eyes closed. I want to pray for a second group of people. These are those of you you made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you have a, a need that you need provided for. Uh, maybe God's been calling you in a step of obedience, but you've been too afraid to do it. And I just want to pray for you. Jesus, I mean, I just pray for everyone in the room. God, there's some people who need a miracle. They don't know how they're going to fill their oil tank or how they're going to heat their house. And maybe they've got a car situation and they don't know how they're going to get their car fixed and they can get to work and it's all of the different things that happen and all of the different things that could go wrong. They're just not sure how it can happen. God, I pray that you would just release your resources to them. God, that they would be in a place to experience a miracle, that they would seek you first, God. They wouldn't seek the miracle, but God, they would seek you. They would love you. And God, they would live rightly. And God, you will meet their need 
just the exact right time. And God, I pray you'd do it in a way that, that only you could get credit for. God, that they would just know you know what they don't. And God, that they would see your unbelievable power. Give people courage to apply for jobs. Give people courage to continue their education. Give people courage to, to work ethically in their workplace. Give people courage to give. Give people courage just to, whatever step you're calling them in their life to take, give them the courage to do that. And God, we give you thanks. I give you thanks for we, every way you provided for me, you provided for our church. You've done many, many, many little miracles, and we give you all the glory. And God, you've done some pretty huge ones too, and we give you all the glory. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. We're gonna, the band's going to sing here for just a minute, and what I encourage you to do during this time is to either pray where you're at and just talk to God about what's been going on and what maybe what steps he's taken for you to do. You can write down, write down like what God spoke to you today and what he wants you to do. You can write it down in your notebook or in the notes on your phone. And just take this time that's between you and God to um, just to kind of process and digest what he wants to do in your life right now. And then after they sing, I'll come back up.